I'm just mistake me. You know, where you throw out all of the names of all of your kids all at once and hope it sticks. So uh, uh, anyway, I grew up being called Putsy on a regular basis. Um, and I love this family as I love my own. And my heart is breaking for them and the loss of one of my favorite people. But in her honor, I would just like to say, in this house of God, I'm going to say it anyway, a resounding shit the bed. <laughs> Okay, hi, I'm Annie. I'm also one of the special nieces, and I just want to say what an inspiration Putz has been on my life also, because I do what I do, and I am who I am because of her. And I also have 30 plus years of fixing people's hair and cutting and curling, and I love her and our family also. Thank you. Thank you. We are putsies like sisters. And oh, I'm going to break down. But I just wanted to let you know I could tell you a million stories. <laughs> but I, I would have you here for hours. <laughs> we had more fun. We loved each other. We were always friends. And we always will be and want the family to know that if they ever need to chat or want us to come over, we'll come over. I mean, they're like family to us, so uh, Molly. Well, Patsy and Devana were my best friends, and they will be forever. But where you've seen Patsy, you've seen Devana, then you've seen Molly. <laughs> We were always together, and uh, the incredible, incredible job, the love that Kenny had for Putsy. I would go see him in Putz at least once or twice a week. He wouldn't let me do anything. Stubborn ass you are. <laughs> and I would call him and I'd say, Kenny, I need this done. Boom. He was at my place just like that. So just remember everybody, life is short. Please yes. love everybody because you might not be tomorrow. I'm Ellen, and I had the good fortune of meeting Patsy 52 years ago at the St. Cloud Beauty College. From day one, she's just been near and dear to me. I grew up in Bagley, Minnesota, and I was down in St. Cloud with no car. All the kids were going home for weekends, and, and I didn't. And she said, come home with me. And so I did. And the moment I walked into her, her home, her mother, Elvira, and every one of her sisters, everyone just treated me with their hearts of gold and made me family. And on our trip up, we'd leave St. Cloud. We'd get past Little Falls, and then it was Randall, Cushion, Lincoln, Motley, Randall, Cushion, Lincoln. <laughs> we just couldn't wait to get home. So the reason I say I was from Bagley is I do go there very, very often. I live in the city. And every time I drive past Little Falls, I say, Randall Cushion, Lincoln, Motley. And now and again, I wish I had stopped more. But we would stop, call Ken and Putsy, and boy, in a second, they were meeting us at the restaurant. We'd have lunch. Or, and... I'm telling you, these two are so very special. Putsy is so near and dear to me. I'm blessed so many times over to have a friendship. Oh, 
that was so steadfast, nothing could come in the way, and it didn't matter how many days, months, weeks, years passed. We'd sit and chat like no time had passed. So, Putsy, you're going to be in my heart forever. I will remember you. I will remember Ken. Uh, I'll take care of him as well as I took care of you, maybe once a year, once whatever, but I'll always let him know I'm there as a friend. And Greta, I'm sure you don't remember, <laughs> and I, I wish I could remember the instance, but your mother said, I don't know what it was you said to Greta, but she just adores you, and I, I have no idea. And I came to your, gra my husband and I came to your graduation, and when Bucky graduated, we I couldn't be there. And so we have a family, my husband has a family cabin over by Lake Sullivan. So he and our brother-in-law came to your graduation party. Um, and Sarah, oh goodness, this is a good one. We were passing through, we stopped to have uh, supper, and I said to one of the waitresses, I said, "Oh golly, do you know Putsy?" And she goes, "Oh, do I know? Do I know Putsy?" She said, "She's in the hospital in Staples right now, having a baby or had a baby." And so, we usually go 64, but we went over to Staples and we went to see Putsy at the hospital as she was having a little Sarah. So. You're all dear to me. I just wish I had been a bigger part of each of your lives. So, Thank you, all of you, for sharing beautiful memories for Ken and his kids and lots of friends and family to remember. Let's hear that next song. Around 
As I read to you a minute ago, Putsy was born Paula Jean Bremer in 1953. Ken reminded me the other day that her daddy, Joseph, was a janitor here at the Molly Schools, and for whatever reason, Dad Joe started calling little Paula Putsy. And we have known her as Putz and Putsy ever since. She started her work ethic early. She started probably at Elroy Truck Stop, where she learned to work. I was told a story also the other day, and I read to you that uh, at 12 years of age, she met Kenneth Swecker, and it was love at first sight. So I wondered about that, assuming they probably went to school together, or at least were community people who knew each other somewhat, and I wondered about that. But I've learned that Ken was delivering papers back when Potts was 12, 13 years old, perhaps even fill, uh, delivering papers as a fill-in. And he was expected to collect the fees from the Bremer household. When young Mr. Kenneth entered into the Bremer home, there was Miss Paula Jean washing dishes. And apparently for them, whether they, how well they knew each other before, I don't know, but it was in fact, as I read, love at first sight. Some years later, they were married. And to them were born three wonderful children. They crossed the 51 years of marriage mark last month. As you have heard, family has always been important to Putsy. Family gatherings, camping, agate hunting, garage sales, being with her sisters, being with her family was always a highlight for her. Spider Lake, I've heard of uh, the thrill, the fun, the excitement, the adventure of Spider Lake and other places. Some of you are here that played softball with her years ago. I read to you that animals, were important to her. We've heard that feeding people was always important to her. She had a servant's heart. And even though I read to you that she loved animals, she did not love snakes. She did not love bears. And she did not love ticks. We all know of her years of struggling with Lyme's disease and endless, endless trips to the doctors literally all over the state, trying to figure out, trying to help her. She did not like snakes, I've learned, and probably more than once she needed to call upon her kids or someone to remove a snake for her, even if it might be a little blow snake. She didn't like snakes. She did not like bears, especially when she had been in the garage out here in the home on, their home on 28, shucking corn, dealing with corn, working corn, whatever she was doing. And the corn smell was evident, apparently, to the bear also. And when Putz went into the house, a little while later, she came back to the garage, and the bear was exiting the garage. And it's hard to tell which one at that point was more surprised, Putz or the bear. Ken has told me, too, he has uh, discovered some time back his beloved putsy loved shoes. Lots of shoes. But that's a story for another time. Many family trips were made to be with family, including Wyoming, and I know there's some watching from Casper, Wyoming today as well as other places, but many trips were made there to be with them also. 
I want to say one more thing about Ken and Putsy before I read some scripture. And then I read some scripture today that was, uh, that was uh, chosen by the family. Very, very good scripture. I'm going to read a little more scripture at the committal service. Also very, very good and very, very appropriate. All chosen by the family. But I want to say this first. 51 years ago, when Kenneth and Paula were married, they probably stood before the pastor priest and they committed to one another things like this, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, and in sickness and in health. And 51 years ago, Ken and Putsy wouldn't have known what that might mean in the next 51 years. But over those years, and particularly these last couple years, together they have found out what it means to be committed in sickness and in health. They live that out. As you have heard, Ken was caring for his bride night and day in sickness and in health. It reminds me some of the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 when he wrote, Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but I don't have love, I'm just a noise. And so what he begins to describe, love needs to be acted out. And Ken continued to show his love to Putsy when she was sick and weak and frail. Paul says, even though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith that could even move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. It's this love equation that makes a difference, he said. Even if I would give all my goods to feed the poor, and I give my body to be burned, but I haven't got love, that profits me nothing. And then he begins to describe love a little bit. This is a biblical definition. The first thing he says, love suffers long and is kind. It doesn't envy. Doesn't parade itself about. Isn't puffed up. Doesn't behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never feels, fails. Now, I suspect if you ask Ken and Putsy if life was perfect, they would say not really, because none of our lives are perfect, but that love was displayed, was on display from Ken to his bride. And so may I say to you, my friend, on behalf of your family and us, well done, sir, in living out the biblical definition of love to take care of your beautiful bride. I will share John 14, as Greta and the family has given to me, I will share some of that at the committal service. But they also gave to me John 3.16, and we all know what that says, or we probably have heard it. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, that's Jesus, should not perish but have everlasting life. We're, we're familiar with that part. But I want to read a few verses that lead up to John 3.16. I want to understand where Jesus was coming from when he told us, as well as the people of that day, what John 6, 3, 16 is. And so here's the story leading up to it. I'll try to be brief. It's only a few verses, but I want, to, I want us to understand the story. Why? Because I believe the Bible is real. I believe it's true. And I believe that we will all cross this threshold from life to death to eternity at some point. We all will.
and I care enough about us from this community and us that live and breathe here to know what Jesus said about John 3.16. John 3 says there was a man. He was a religious leader, actually. His name was Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus one night and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Okay, this is a religious leader. This is a guy that's in the know up here. He obeyed the commandments of God. He knew the principles of Moses. He knew the things of God. And so he comes to Jesus with a curious mind, a curious thought, wondering, who is this guy? Jesus didn't answer that statement. We know that you must be from God because nobody can do what you're doing if you ain't from God. Jesus didn't even answer that. He simply said to them in John 3.3, 3, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus would have been just like, he was just like the rest of us would have been. What in the world is that supposed to mean? And he said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb? I'm working up to John 3, 16, because it's all part of it. That's the only thing he would have known. Well, I was born by my mom. Well, that's the only thing I know about. How can, he, how can that happen again? And Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is, born of, one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh, referring you were born from your mother Nicodemus, is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Jesus is saying to this religious man who knew the religious terminology, Jesus is saying to him, you have been born of the flesh, but now, Nicodemus, you need to be born of the Spirit. Nicodemus simply says in verse 9, John chapter 3, how can these things be? And that conversation continues between Jesus and the religious leader. And in John 13, or almost to 16, Jesus said this to Nicodemus, No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven. He's talking about himself. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And then he says something strange. He, he probably would have thought this strange, but he would have known what he was talking about. Jesus said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. He would have known about that story. That comes from Numbers chapter 21. This religious leader would have known about Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. You probably remember the story too. A disease had broken out and people were dying like crazy. And God said, what are we going to do? You got to stop this. And, and God told him, put a serpent on a pole and stick it there. And when they look upon the serpent, they will live instead of die. That's what he's talking about. We're working to John 3.16. And he said to them, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, which he will be lifted up on the cross, that whoever believes in him, that's the Son of Man, as they had to look at the serpent and believe, he's saying to Nicodemus, you must believe in him who will be lifted up for you. He's talking about Jesus himself. Whoever looks upon him, and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then he said this, for God so loved you and everybody else that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus speaking about himself, that whoever believes in him, that's look upon him and live. Look upon him by faith. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then he said this, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, friends, Ken and I had this conversation just the other day. God sent Jesus to die in our place 
Because after all, from the Garden of Eden on, we've been inherited sin, and someone needed to deal with my sin, Potsy's sin, our sin. God for, so loved the world that He sent His Son that whoever would embrace the Son by faith, look upon Him as those people in Numbers 21 did, the snake to live, whoever looks upon Christ will live. Kenny and I were just talking about what does that mean? Jesus isn't necessarily asking me to be a free Methodist. I just happen to be the pastor here. He's asking us to trust in Him and Him alone for our salvation. This is a heart condition that he's addressing with Nicodemus. He said, I know you got all the mechanics of religion figured out. You got all that figured out. 